um, Navy's Sea Ice Symposium back in July, the one that uh, Pablo coordinated. So some of you have heard this before. Um, we, we've added a little bit at the end, but the, the basic material is similar. And we'll be doing it in three segments. I'll do the first third, Florence will do the middle, and then I'll finish up at the end. Uh, but the, uh, the presentation covers a sea ice database that extends back to 1850. Um, and the, this current slide shows the motivation. The motivation was that the, the, the satellite record goes back to 1979. That's essentially three and a half decades. And we, we're all well aware of the trend we've seen in sea ice during this, this satellite period. But to get a perspective on the recent trend uh, relative to the, the variations that have occurred over a longer time frame, we would like a CX record that goes back considerably farther. And that's what we're out to produce or what we have produced in this product, uh, project. Um, there are pre-satellite sources of data. We'll show you examples of these in, in a few minutes. But they're diverse and they're often undigitized. So there's a lot of digitization of old sea ice data that is a, a prerequisite for this project. And one of the key motivations is summarized in this graphic. Um, it's a, a time series of the ice coverage, the ice extent in January and July from the Hadley um, sea ice and ocean, uh, sea ice and sea surface temperature database version one. This was actually used as the, uh, the lower boundary condition for a number of reanalyses, atmospheric reanalyses that were done. It was used in some uh, atmospheric model simulations that required lower boundary information. And you can see how for the uh, much of the late 18th century, early 19th century, there, there's no variability in there. The, uh, the database included a climatology. Um, We've actually been working with the Hadley Center. Uh, Florence and I visited there when we started this project, and we are coordinating this present activity with what the Hadley Center is doing. So the, uh, the available lower boundary conditions for reanalyses and other modeling applications will be uh, improved over what you're seeing on the screen right now. So that was one of the main motivations. Um, in fact, the uh, the immediate motivation is the reanalysis group at ESRL, the NOAA Boulder Lab, with Gil Campo and Jeff Whitaker. They're going to be using this database for their reanalysis effort. So the objectives are uh, sort of twofold. One is we want a digital ice atlas that maximizes the useful information on sea ice that's out there. We want this, uh, this product to be consistently formatted through time. It has a monthly time resolution back to 1850. And in areas where there's no data, we'll talk about this towards the end, we've provided a space and time reconstruction. We've attempted to provide best estimates of what the sea ice might, be, might have been like in areas that are not covered with actual observations. The other part of this is to provide a thorough documentation so that people know what they're using when they uh, work with this product. Um, that documentation includes the description of all the data sources and accompanying the, the actual product is a source information map, a map showing what sources went into each particular monthly field. So there are really two parallel uh, products here, the actual sea ice data time series in, in map form and then the source map that accompanies each of those monthly concentration maps. And we've also provided a uh, documentation of this interpolation procedure, this fill-in procedure for the missing data, and we will highlight that towards the end. Um, but without, uh, without waiting any longer, I think we should jump right into the, the main data sources so that you can see what we have fused together and this is where Florence will take over, um, starting with a summary chart and then showing you some examples. So if we can transition to Florence here. Okay, Florence, I'm passing you the ball and you should see the big, there we go. Okay, so let me uh, view slideshow. There we go. 
Okay, so uh, there are 11 historical sources plus passive microwave concentration, which is the only source we use right now in this version from 1979 on. So that red streak uh, at the right-hand side is, is uh, passive microwave concentration. So this is um, the, the list of the sources starting in 1850 and ending in 2015 off to the right. Uh, so um, 11 historical sources plus passive microwave plus an analog method of filling spatial and temporal gaps. So they're all identified with a different source number in the net CDF file. And they're listed here in rough order of that identifying source number. So the first few were also used in uh, Chapman and Walsh 91. That's the citation for uh, a data set uh, that we have online here at NSIDC. And that data set has enjoyed a lot of popularity uh, because it goes back to uh, before the satellite era, era and it's an Arctic-wide data set. So we're very happy to be at this point um, about to update that. Um, so I uh, just mentioned that the Danish Meteorological Institute is actually, charts from D DMI are actually in three of these sources, and I'll get into that in a minute or two here. Uh, and also using this chart, I want to point out that prior to 1970, um, 1979, the data are gappy, uh, and the bottom two uh, lines here show where uh, the filling uh, method has been used for spatial or temporal gaps. And you can see that the spatial gap filling method is used for pretty much uh, somewhere within the entire um, uh, data set prior to, to 1979. The longest single historical record we have uh, is the AXIS um, Project's Ice Edge position record. And as with other historical data for which there's only an edge position, uh, concentration is inferred uh, based on um, uh, past microwave data in a way that, that John will explain in a, a later slide. So this and the following slides uh, will illustrate some aspect of each of these uh, 11 sources. First of all, the, the passive microwave record uh, with a view of ice extent at the Arctic uh, minimum of, for the beginning of the record at left, that's uh, from September 11, 1979, and from just a few weeks ago, um, well, September 11, uh, 2015 uh, at right. So you can see right away, well, there's a lot of lot less ice, um, but have there been similar cases prior to the satellite era? And John has a slide near the end that's going to put this in historical context uh, very nicely. So on to the historical sources. First we have um, the National Ice Center charts. And these charts are a major part of another source called uh, the Walsh and Johnson source. And let me explain that first. Um, in the Walsh and Johnson source, back in the, I think it was the late 70s um, or early 80s, um, John essentially laid a grid over paper sheet analyses like, like the one shown here and used that as a way to, um, to get it uh, digitizing ice concentration uh, represented by the, the coding in, in uh, this, what was a paper chart. So data from the National Ice Center uh, and its precursors uh, cover the time period from 1953 on. They, they don't all uh, look like this, um, but there's a good record from 1953 on. Uh, and I'll note that uh, NSIDC, we have a gridded version of a large part of this series available separately. It wasn't, that, that version wasn't used directly in the data set we're talking about today, um, but we may use it for a follow-on um, version of this, this data set. The Dean collection uh, covers seeds around Alaska. And again, these are paper charts uh, that were scanned under a, a NOAA program some years ago now. And then uh, scans, so you can, you can see the scans. They're available for online from NSIDC. The scans date from 1953 through 1986. So to be able to use these for um, uh, the, 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 the um, data product we're talking about now, uh, we had to get them into some sort of um, coded format. Um, and this was done by 
uh, Lena and by others at SNAP at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and they interpreted the coding in these these charts, uh, which is a, um, a difficult task, and georeferenced the scan and then pulled concentration uh, from these these scans. And this uh, moved the information into a form uh, that uh, Bill Chapman could then use in his code. And here's an example of ice concentration um, chart from the Arctic and Antarctic uh, Research Institute. And these cover the area north of Russia, obviously. And these gridded data are also available separately from, as a separate standalone data set from NSIDC. Uh, they date from 1933 through 2006, although we only, of course, used through 1978 here uh, in, in this product because we had passed the microwave after that. Um, like the National Ice Center charts, um, these code concentration and other attributes using the WMO uh, AIG code. Uh, so that's the convention used by operational um, ice services. And uh, this is a image of a uh, Danish Meteorological Institute uh, charts, uh, chart. And it, if I had to choose, I'd say that these charts are the most important of all the uh, historical data. Beginning in the late 1800s, the Danes were compiling information on ice conditions from commercial and exploratory activities. Uh, and they published an annual yearbook that included uh, uh, as well as the observations, uh, a best guess as to where the ice edge was. So that's the white field in this example from, from 1924. So in, so in contrast, there, there are red, red dots, if you uh, look closely, and these show the location of an actual observation. And if you look up in the right-hand corner, you can see there's a legend with categories such as tight pack ice, and that's the, the solid red dots. So these uh, categories can be tied to WMO concentration ranges. And so we were very, very fortunate to have an unusually gifted undergraduate, uh, Vivian Underhill, who converted scans, these scans to uh, coded vector files that uh, at the University of Alaska, uh, they could be made ready for uh, Bill Chapman to use in his code. And the concentration data that uh, Vivian deduced from these charts is now its own data set at NSIDC, as well as um, the original scan, so you, you can get them both separately. Uh, but in addition to maps like these, uh, the Danish Meteorological Institute compiled textual logbook accounts that indicated ice or no ice uh, at a location, and this information was used as well as its own source. So DMI shows up in, in uh, a few places. And so this, uh, as I mentioned, the longest historical record is from the Axis compilation of ice edge records in the Nordic Seas. Um, the view there from April and August just showing the, the density of these, of these ice edge positions. Um, and this too is available from NSIDC as, it's, as a separate data uh, collection covering from 1750 through 2002 and all. These ice edge positions from Axis were used to get at ice concentration inboard of the edge position in a way that, uh, that John uh, will explain. The next chart shows, this shows ice extent off Newfoundland from a collection compiled by Brian Hill, and it dates back to the early uh, 1800s. Uh, that's 1820 on the left and 1990 on the right of, the, of this chart. Um, ice extent. And I just want to note we do not have this available, available separately as its own collection. Um, I'd, I'd like to get it and, and hope to still. But the information is included in the product uh, that we're talking about today. Uh, and finally, here's an example from 1877 where we have whaling ship observations. And uh, the yellow dots are where ice was observed, it's noted in the logbook, and the red or pink dots were where ice was not observed, it was um, open. So these were used to make polygons of assumed ice concentration, and again, this was done by uh, Vivian Underhill 
with help from uh, Bill uh, Chapman, uh, John, uh, and myself. And the University of Alaska uh, Fairbanks then prepped the data for use in, in the atlas. I also want to note that Hayo Eichen and Andy Mahoney had uh, a lot to do with making these, these data available uh, for this sort of use. And I, that's all I have on the historical sources. And let's see if I can turn presenter role. I'll just hit stop sharing. Yeah, that's, I turn it back over, Florence. John, okay, you thanks. should see um, a pop-up on your screen. Yes. Uh, so we should now be looking at the, um, the slide that says examples of synthesized ice concentration. Is that where we... Uh, you have to click share my desktop first. Oh, all right. I'll get back to that one. Uh -oh. This is where we ran into trouble before. So um, it's not in the browser window, it's in the WebEx window. Right, okay. I've actually checked out uh, again. Would it be possible to control this from Florence's end? And I'll just say next slide. Um, yep, I'll just give it back to her to and you just say next slide. Sure, yeah, there are only about six more, so okay. uh, this will work. Okay, let me get there. All right, John. Sure, have we got the, uh, the slide that says examples, synthesized ice concentration maps? Okay, um, so this, this slide shows uh, examples from two of the earlier 20th century um, months, uh, they're, they're representative ones, showing examples of the, what we call the fused product. We, we've taken the, uh, the information from the various sources, we have assigned a hierarchy of uh, a ranked uh, priority to the various sources, and gone with the highest priority uh, data source wherever there's overlap. And we've used the fill-in procedure that I'll mention in a minute, but this is what we end up with. The left two panels show the concentration fields, 1935 and 1956 examples. The panels on the right show the sources. So there's a different color for each source, and the, uh, the source code uh, scale is down there at the bottom. So users get a, uh, a list of the sources that go with that, uh, that color bar on the bottom. Uh, next slide. Um, let me see here. Okay, now there are two value added steps that we went through, and I'll, I'll comment on these briefly. Um, the first one is to uh, try and improve upon the ice edge information. A number of those sources that Florence showed uh, gave ice edge information only. And the procedure here was to specify a concentration gradient. Um, I'll show an example next. The, um, the second value added step is this analog procedure to fill in the missing data. Um, next slide. Okay. This is the, um, the example of the concentration gradient that was imposed. In this case, there was an axis ice edge in the North Atlantic. We took the passive microwave era concentration fields and used those to superimpose the concentrations on the ice edge so that we came up with a gradient of concentrations and that the example is down at the bottom there. So that's one step in which we attempted to capture um, the, the spatial variation of concentrations in addition to the ice edge. Next slide. This is a summary of that uh, fill-in procedure for the missing, the areas with missing uh, information, no sources at all. And in a nutshell, we used an analog approach. Uh, there's a summary of the algorithm in steps one through four. I won't read each one, but we, we essentially uh, took a, um, we, we, for any location where there was no information in a month and year, we went to the more recent decades and for the same calendar month, uh, picked the best analog years 
where the best analogs were defined by the fit to the areas with existing information in that older historical year that was that was gappy. So we had a uh, an iterative procedure here, and the bottom line is that there is uh, uh, anywhere from one to three analog fields that are used to fill in the missing information in any uh, older period without data. Next slide. Um, the summary of the advantages and disadvantages of the analogs. We, we do use actual uh, concentrations for the fill-in procedure. That's what we consider an advantage. Uh, and this eliminates the need for basis functions, EOFs, that might not be equipped to handle the uh, somewhat unique character of ice edge information. Disadvantages are that the, um, there's a potential bias towards the more recent decades where most of the analogs come from, and there's no guarantee that the spatial patterns of variability are the same in recent decades as they were back in the 1800s and early 1900s. Next slide. I'll just uh, highlight a couple of um, summary um, uh, plots here showing the, um, the, the um, ice extent from the, the final product. Um, this is a time series of the March and September ice extent um, from the, uh, actually from 1850 through the present, and you see how the recent decline shows up in the summer, but not in the winter. The next slide highlights the, um, I think the, the important point we wanted to convey here. This is a summary of the, uh, it's a time series for each of the calendar months. Summer months are at the bottom in red, the winter months and spring months are in blue at the top. The point here is that the interannual variability is comparable in the earlier part of the record to what we have observed or what we deduce from the passive microwave in the recent decades. So at least in terms of temporal variance, we think we've come up with a reasonably consistent product. Um, next slide highlights the, um, the the extreme minimum years, uh, the summer minima from the three tersiles of the data record, late 1800s, early 1900s, and the most recent period. And this drives home the point that the, um, the, the recent retreat has no real precedence in the, uh, the first hundred years of the record. Next slide is the conclusions um, summary. A um, couple of conclusions that have emerged um, from the, about the methodology are that the, uh, the different types of data can be synthesized, um, but this, this fusion procedure is a crucial part of the product. So we, we've taken great pains to document it, and we're also continuing to experiment with it. We're not convinced that the, uh, the optimum fusion procedure is, is, is what's actually uh, the one that we have used to produce the plots you just saw. So we were, we're not closing the door on that step. The second conclusion is that the, this analog approach with its advantages and disadvantages um, has the, the main caveat that there are probably some low biases introduced in those earlier decades um, by choices of analogs that are primarily from the more recent decades. So we're continuing to experiment with the analogs as well. In terms of the output, um, the conclusion is that the, this recent retreat of the last decade or two is unique in the post-1850 period. There's nothing like it um, in the, uh, the first 100, 130 years of the record. And the other um, conclusion is that this recent loss is much greater in summer than in winter consistent with what climate model projections show for the future. So we, we think there's a, a nice consistency emerging between the historical record, the longer term record, and what climate models are reproducing. Next slide. The next steps. Um, we, we, we're somewhat uneasy about the reliance on the passive microwave for the recent decades. We, we all know that there are underestimated concentrations, especially in the warm season when the surface is wet. So we're planning a transition to the National Ice Center gridded charts, or the, the uh, digital versions of those charts, as the primary input for the last few decades. A, a next uh, step uh, in the 
fusion procedure is the use of weights for different sources rather than just a binary all or nothing uh, reliance on one particular source. We plan to incorporate some additional data. And uh, a big activity that we have now planned is a user interface that will come up with uh, several uh, user capabilities that I'll just briefly step through and then we'll be done. Uh, the next slide uh, shows the, the prototype for this user interface. Um, we constructed a uh, historical sea ice atlas for Alaska. It's higher resolution than the one we've just looked at and a user interface that can be transitioned over to the global database. And the next slide shows an example of um, a concentration field that a user can, uh, can uh, use, can uh, visualize. Uh, the user can choose any month or year of the database and, and plot the, uh, the concentration field. We're hoping to do this with the the Panarctic fields. The next slide um, shows the capability from this, this interface to plot a time series. This is a time series for concentration at one particular point. It's in the Beaufort Sea. Um, it's for a uh, particular calendar month, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's something the user can choose a calendar month for and a location for and come up with a time series on the fly. And the next slide is the um, time series of the open water season length. We're, we're planning to put this capability into the user interface. This diagram shows the open water season length in white at that same point in the Beaufort Sea, starting in 1850 at the bottom, going year by year through uh, the most recent couple of years at the top. You can see the widening of the open water season length. So this capability is something we'd like to include as well. And the last slide is the acknowledgments. Uh, we'd like to thank um, Bill Chapman, who did a lot of the work in the data fusion process. Uh, Scott Stewart at NSIDC has helped more, more recently in the, uh, the quality control of the product that we've turned out. Hayo Eichen and Andy Mahoney, as, as Florence mentioned, provided the whaling ship data. And we'd also like to thank the NOAA Climate Program Office. They, they funded the data synthesis process at this point. So that's it. Uh, hopefully we're, we're on the final slide and uh, glad to take any questions. As a reminder, you might need to unmute yourself to ask your questions. Okay, thank you, Florence. Thank you, John. Uh, this is very interesting, and I think this is an important uh, product and contribution to what we know about sea ice. Um, and of course, obviously, it's a continuing um, effort and is going to be updated and, and will be further improvements that are good to see. Um, any questions from anybody for Florence and John? Don't forget to Hi, unmute yourself. This, this is Walt. Um, a couple questions. Um, one, um, kind of related to the passive microwave. Uh, you show the the chart for the first. You show the chart for the passive mic or for the primary data sources. And for the modern record, you have only the passive microwave, and then all the historical records. Have you looked at um, any kind of uh, overlap to con compare um, the consistency between those? Um, because I, I recall from earlier, you know, there was an overlap, and, and you do see a kind of a discontinuity there between the sources. Has that been looked at to to try and um, make it consistent across that that break? Um, this is John. We, we have looked at it, and we're, we're certainly aware of it. And that, in fact, is the motivation for going to the um, the NIC charts, the National Ice Center charts, for the more recent decades. Um, as you might guess, this that discontinuity you mentioned is stronger in the warm season than it is in the cold season. Um, so I, I think we, we do need to be aware of that uh, in, in any uses of this this database that goes back beyond the um, the, the late 70s. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and relating to the ice charts, um, that it makes sense uh, because you know in the sense of 
um, the biases in the past of microwave, what you know, the ice charts are, are looking at is probably more consistent with these historical charts. Um, but there's also an issue with those in that you know the, those depend on the quality and amount of input. Um, and so there's potential inconsistencies within those charts as well, um, particularly uh, with the advent of SAR data, um, where you really see a change in, in how the, uh, the ice is mapped between those. So is that another thing you're, you will look at as you transition to that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This, this fact, is Florence. Uh, go ahead, Florence. Well, I was just going to say, um, no, we didn't look specifically at that um, that change in that particular source when SAR was introduced, but that's, um, you point to why it's so important to document each data source thoroughly, because when it comes down to it, every user is going to have to make their own uh, judgment um, about the quality of the data, and certainly the changes in data sources for the NIC charts is something that, that we note in the documentation. But uh, your, your remark about the discontinuity uh, when the path of microwave takes up in, in 1979 uh, reminded me to let everyone know that even though the chart that uh, may, you may be seeing on the screen right now talks about the Nimbus 7 uh, and the uh, NASA team algorithm, in the end we didn't go with the NASA team algorithm. We went with the uh, CDR, the, the NOAA and NSIDC CDR, which uses a blend of, of NASA team and bootstrap algorithm, and I think that that, um, uh, oh, that break is, isn't as, uh, that jump or jump down isn't as severe as it would be otherwise if we'd stayed with just NASA team. Is that clear? <laughs> okay, thank, yeah, that's, yeah, thanks Florence um, and John. Any anybody else have a question or comment for Florence and John? Uh, I'll say uh, something. I noticed okay, something I, interesting about the variability in summer in the past was quite high in July and August. Um, that was really intriguing to me, and a little bit less high in September. And then another really intriguing aspect was that there seemed to be an increase in the sea ice coverage in um, winter time in the middle of the record. So do you have any things? Yeah, exactly, that figure. Um, if, if you have any thoughts about how likely those are to be real, that would be worth, worth my uh, understanding. Thank you. This is Casper at NCAR that I can I chip into this with one comment and this is about error bars. You know, with I think first of all, I think this is this is a great step in the direction of, of trying to combine these different records. But when you have a hierarchical structure of uh, switching from one source to another, depending which one you have available, there might be a um a potential for really kind of regimes of depending which which source has what uh, available at, at any particular time and so you might be jumping around a little bit so if there were any way of trying to leave out some sources and doing the reconstruction and then seeing what the the resulting um, series look like and how much they would change this might give at least some hint of error bars around the you know the long time series that you showed with the the summer and the the winter series. This would then also allow to maybe connect to some much longer records that have been done in the paleoclimate community where they have tried to estimate what variability looks like and what some of the larger trends are so that's just the comment in the same direction. How robust are some of these? individual signals that we are seeing next to just the interannual variability, but maybe some of these decadal structures. And uh, so what, what is the variability? That might be interesting. Thanks. Yeah, this is John. I, I think that that's a great suggestion, and it is one that can be followed up. Uh, and I'd see two steps. One is 
in areas where there's uh, there are multiple sources at the same time. Um, replace one source with another and see what the differences are. The other is in areas where there's only one source, drop it out, let that analog, that interpolation procedure do its thing and see what the impact is. So I, I think both of those could lead to some estimates on uncertainties, although it's it's sort of a messy problem because of the way that the sources come and go and they're geographically uh, uh, separated at times. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yes, Martin, um, I'm, I'm going to have the last word here, if you'll forgive me, with a comment and then a question, actually for Jim Overland, if you're still on, Jim. And, but I, I noted that you mentioned how Icon and Andy Mahoney had contributed whaling ship records. And that reminded me of the work at the project that Jim Overland and Kevin Wood have, uh, where they're going back into the old records. Um, most recently, a project looking at the Coast Guard tougher records in the National Archives. And I wondered if there is useful sea ice information in those which could be contributed to the sea ice atlas. Um, and this is John. I, I think there definitely is. The um, the whaling data we used was only for the uh, Pacific sector, the Bering Sea, the Chukchi, and, and the Beaufort. Uh, Kevin's work is uh, bringing in the North Atlantic, which is actually the the larger segment of the uh, the, the ice edge. Um, now, some of those ship reports were incorporated into the Danish charts and the Axis charts, but there are others that Kevin is, is uncovering that uh, have not worked their way into the, the other sources. So I think that is fertile ground for uh, either uh, validating or incorporating into the, um, the especially the Atlantic sector product. I, I, I was under the impression that, that some of the whaling data that Kevin was working with was incorporated into the system at, at UAF. I'm, I'm not sure about the uh, 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 about the revenue cutter uh, data. Well, the, the ship reports that were in the Danish Meteorological Institute narratives were incorporated. Yeah. But that was about the extent of it. Okay. I, I had a quick, quick question on uh, you have any feeling for the distribution of of how the analogs were picked uh, for the earlier years, where they they kind of just randomly pulled out of the last 50 years, and and uh, you know I wonder if if the last 10 years uh, with with uh, thinner ice would would really be a different. Uh, uh, set. Well, I, I should have mentioned we, we actually excluded the 2007 and onward period from the analog selection. So oh, yeah, okay, that's great. The analog selection went through 2005, but the, the, the decade with the most analog selected was the most recent one, the decade up to 2005. So that, that's where the concern about the, the low bias comes in. Okay, I, I think we must move on. It's uh, 1.45. I'd like to thank Florence and John for their presentation. And if anybody has questions, um, you can always send an email message or pick up the phone uh, to call John or Florence.